Welcome everyone and thank you for joining our webinar today. I'm Emily King um, and my role is Business Engagement Officer of the Fairwild Foundation. Uh, and I work with current and potential Fairwild businesses to help them make the most of their certification, as well as wider communication around the importance of Fairwild. Uh, we've also got some great guest speakers lined up today and we're excited to talk to you all about Fairwild. So what are we going to cover today? Well, firstly, we're going to hear about why we need to consider wild plant sourcing. Then we'll learn a bit more about what Fairwild is, how it relates to wild plant sourcing issues, and then we'll cover how it relates to your business. Uh, and also hear from two of our long-standing brands about their Fairwild stories, uh, Pucker Herbs and Traditional Medicinals. And then we'll finish off with how you as a business can get involved with Fairwild. But now, without further ado, we'll hear from Nastia Timoshina. Uh, Nastia is the Senior Programme Coordinator in Sustainable Trade at Traffic who are the Wildlife Trade Specialists and partner of the Fairwild Foundation. She's also co-chair of the IUCN Medicinal Plant Specialist Group, so many years of experience there and expertise on the issues surrounding the trade in plants. And she's going to tell us more about how these issues relate to business. Thank you very much um, and uh, welcome from me as well to everyone. We have over 50 people, which is very exciting. Um, Hope you can hear me all right um, and see me okay as well. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about why I care about wild and I'm going to start doing this by talking just saying a couple of words about traffic itself. So um, next please. So um, traffic is um, a non-governmental organization and we work to ensure that uh, trade in wild plants and animals is not a threat to the conservation of nature. Um, we approach it in a number of different ways. Um, some of the work we do is a lot more visible and known and it concerns often more charismatic um, species um, of animals in particular, um, something you hear a lot about in the news. Um, but we also, um, as part of our work, um, engage around the approaches to ensure that where trade from the wild is happening, it is legal and sustainable. And so our engagement with the Fair Wild Initiative is firmly sitting in that area of ensuring that the offtake of plants and trade in them um, is beneficial to both conservation of nature as well as people. And um, the first slide I wanted to show um, as a sort of starting point of, of my little um, contribution to this webinar is taken from um, a report that was published um, last year, um, which essentially looked at the major concerns and the urgency of responses needed to address the biodiversity loss and the crisis around biodiversity loss around the world. So um, the image is taken from the report itself and um, essentially it shows a lot of um, major negative trends around both the species, so the species survival that's reducing the number of species that actually uh, are extinct in comparison to pre kind of pre pre industrial um, era, um, but also the concerns around the degradation of ecosystems um, and influence um, on a number of different elements of biodiversity. Um, this picture also tries to capture um, what is driving this loss of biodiversity, and of course, it shows it, pay, it tries to, to in a very simple. Um, way to show a very complex picture which um, talks about the interaction of different drivers of biodiversity loss among which are direct exploitation so offtake of species um, as well as the land and sea use change um, and climate change and other factors and all of these are really important to keep considering as we're thinking about wild plants and why we're, we're talking about them in particular today. So zooming in into wild plants and use and trade. Um, so what's um, known about the, this, this whole range of species is that there is almost 30,000 species that have well-documented medicinal and aromatic uses. Um, and roughly about 10% of them are in trade internationally. Um, and majority of those are traded through wild harvest. You'll notice on this slide, there is a little wiggly sign in front of all of these uh, points and it's intentional um, because the figures are really actually quite hard to um, obtain. Um, and in large, in, in part, that's, that's large, um, you know, part of the problem um, because trade in wild plant resources is just not a known 
phenomenon. It's not something that is uh, researched significantly. It's not something that governments are reporting well through their national statistics. And it's not something that's very visible in companies and supply chains. So something that um, I think is, is an important part of addressing the whole issue around sustainability. Um, what we know about, uh, what do we know about this threat to, to the species? Um, I've got here some figures from the IUCN Medicinal Plant Specialist Group, um, and those are uh, from two years back. Um, and essentially, um, the short summary of this slide is we don't, don't know very much about how threatened this species are, and this in itself is a cause for concern. Um, this assessment is against the um, authoritative list, um, IUCN Red List uh, of Threatened Species, um, that essentially looks into how the species are doing against the extinction threat criteria. So only less than 10% of species have been assessed against it, um, and out of those, 20% or roughly 20% are in threatened categories. Um, this, is, this is a very large number of species um, and is a major source of concern. Now, of course, what is really useful to, to um, probably to point out here is that if there was a more comprehensive assessment of this group of species, this ratio could be quite different. Because of course, we're talking about the plants that have been in use for, for centuries um, and are probably quite resilient in general to harvesting pressure. One thing that has been changing, however, um, is the levels of trade. So what we see, um, next please. Um, what we see happening um, year on year um, or decade on decade is a general increase in the trade in, in, in this species and there are multiple reasons to why this is happening. Um, industry itself is diversifying. Um, we see, you know, we see major interest, for example, in, in cosmetics or, or novel food sectors in ingredients that are traditionally used in traditional medicine systems. And of course, that puts just additional pressure and, and more, you know, more trade happening in this, um, in this plants. What I'm interested in here um, for you to note is, is less the actual figures, but more the trend. Um, so something that it is a cause of concern, because um, even though we might we might think that for a lot of the species, um, their conservation status could be quite safe at the moment. This could be changing very rapidly. And we've seen examples again and again of species being affected so much by the changing demand. Next, please. Um, and then, of course, another really, really key part of the story is people. So even though I'm here to talk about why I care about wild plants, I really don't think you can exclude people from the conversation. Um, and this in particular because we're talking about wild harvesting. Millions of wild harvesters involved in this trade, um, often they are part of poor and marginalized communities. Um, there is very, very high reliance on, on plants for health and income for those communities. Um, you know, there are multiple examples of this. Um, I manage a project uh, with our partners in Nepal where um, you know, over 15,000 people in high um, Himalayas are dependent on income from primarily from trade in one um, medicinal plants and it's fascinating what happens if that income is of course replaced or or taken away a lot of this trade is informal and underreported and is surrounded by complex regulations and and they're complex because often um, we have to deal with the issues of access to the resource um, management of the resources um, and this issue around trade being informal and underreported, on one hand, is understandable because, of course, we talk about, very often we talk about, um, you know, very complex circumstances under which harvesting is happening um, and, say, licenses for harvesting are received. Um, but then it also means that there is, quite often, there is no way to judge whether trade is illicit or not, whether trade is sustainable or not, because simply there isn't enough information to be um, to be considering this. In many places around the world, and we see more and more of them kind of um, happening, um, there are major declines in collectors' numbers and the loss of associated traditional knowledge and practices. And you could think, well, okay, that's probably a good thing because I've just been talking about how people are probably over-exploiting some of the species, but it's not a linear connection and actually quite often it's a reverse. Um, quite often sustainable harvesting is what's actually providing an important contribution to the management strategy for species, especially the ones that were managed in this way for uh, a long time. 
And finally, the last thing to say about the people is that the people part of equation for me in the issues around wild plants trade is not just about the harvesters or people involved through supply chains, but it's also the consumers. And of course, what we see, uh, what we know about uh, consumers so far is they're largely in ignorance about the wild plant ingredients in everyday products or their sustainability. So it's something we, you know, it's a complex issue to handle. Next, please. What I've got in here is um, an interesting list that um, provoked some discussion in the first call we had this morning, uh, the first webinar. Um, but essentially, um, we've been trying to think how to, to, to try and narrow down where some of the priorities are around conservation, but also around the social issues of, of supply chains of particular products. So we came up with this wild dozen um, and a, a list of 12 species, actually it's more species because it's rather talking about the products, of course, um, where we know um, the species are important in international trade, they're wild harvested or, or primarily wild harvested, and they're either susceptible to harvesting pressure. So there may be, there may be evidence of them being over harvested, um, or there is unsustainable trade, um, or they could be in supply chains that are problematic from social inequality uh, perspective. Um, and for me, this this is an interesting list that I'd be you know I'd be very happy to connect to anyone interested to engage in it uh, with it um, and have some feedback on it as well, because. I think for me, this list is is a great starting point. You know, if if you're if you're a company, um, you have multiple supply chains, you know, and you're not sure entirely where to start around working on on wild sourcing. Well, have a think. You know, do you have any of these species in your supply chains? Maybe this is a great good place to start um, work around sustainability. Okay. Okay, so um, I suspect that in, in, if you're in the business of wild plant ingredients trade or conservation, there isn't very much new in what I said so far. So why act now? Why now is so important? Um, well, there are some things that are changing and we see them changing in front of our eyes. Um, we do think there is an increased use of herbal remedies for treatments around the world linked to COVID-19. Um, and there is very, very little conversation about how sustainable it is. Um, so I think the, this issue, despite the disruptions in trade chains and concerns around, around their, you know, their stability, I think this issue has never been as important as now. And we're hoping that it could create a space for this conversation and dialogue. There is an increasing consumer interest in products origin, the impacts of, on health from the products and the sustainability. And you know, likewise, we really want to keep supporting this conversation moving forward to encourage people to ask questions from, from the brands, from companies about the origins of the wild sourced plant products. And finally, it's a really big, um, big year, or I should say years now um, for a biodiversity momentum as governments do negotiate this big global biodiversity framework for post 2020 period. And it's not just about convention on biological diversity. It actually is, aim is aiming to bring in variety of, um, of elements um, from different multilateral environmental agreements. Okay. And um, what is the role of companies in all this? Um, so I do think that companies have a major role to play. Um, the post 2020 framework that um, I've just mentioned um, is going to look into reducing the threats to species and landscapes. You'll remember the first image I showed was of this complex diagram which showed the percentages of species that are being in decline that drivers biodiversity loss. There is an important role that companies can play in helping formulate the targets that actually would contribute to the sustainable plant sourcing and hence the survival of biodiversity. Similar to how within the climate convention, there are the science-based targets on reducing um, impacts on climate change. Uh, there are conversations about how the science-based targets will be formulated for biodiversity. And I think this area of wild plants trade, despite it seemingly being fairly small and, and, and unnoticeable in big conversations. I think it plays an important role in how companies can express their commitment to those targets and this big um, biodiversity momentum. And of course, there, is, um, there are links to expressing um, equitable benefit sharing from sustainable wild sourcing um, to contribute to those aims as well. 
So all in all, I think um, for companies developing, linking well sourcing targets at companies level itself could really help to express these commitments to global biodiversity targets and um, hope to be working with all of you around this. Um, thank you. I think this is me. Thank you, Nastia. Uh, so after we've had that insight into the issues surrounding wild plant trade, we'll now hear from Bryony. So Bryony Morgan is the Executive Officer for the, Officer for the Fair Wild Foundation, and she coordinates the Foundation's programme of work, including supporting the Fair Wild Board and Committees in development of the Fair Wild Standard and Certification System. So Bryony is going to share some more detail on what the Fair Wild Standard is um, and what certification entails. Thank you, Bryony. Okay, thanks very much, Emily, and it's great that so many people could join us today. I think that was a great introduction, so I'll just dive into the presentation itself. So what is Fair Wild? So the Fair Wild Standard is a sustainability framework that covers social, environmental and fair trade aspects of sustainability. It was actually developed through two standard setting initiatives that merged. The original ISSC MAP standard focused primarily on biodiversity conservation and was financed through the German government funding for biodiversity. And that standard later merged with the original Fair Wild standard, which was focused on social and fair trade issues and was financed primarily by the Swiss government through the Swiss Import Promotion Organization. Um, the standards combined and now we have Fair Wild version 2, which is a comprehensive framework that covers all these different aspects that are relevant to the, the sustainable harvest and trade of the wild plant ingredients. The standard itself is actually um, applicable to plants, fungi and lichen. At the moment we have our certification scheme fully operational for plant ingredients and we're looking also at um, piloting it with fungi ingredients in the near future as well. So you can use the Fair Wild Standard in different ways. It can also be incorporated into company policy and practice as well. But um, we're talking primarily today about the um, certification scheme. So next slide, thanks. Fair Wild Foundation itself is a Swiss nonprofit organization. We have the mission to transform practices throughout the supply chain for wild products. So really a sustainable use agenda for, for biodiversity uh, products and also to support the livelihoods of the people who are involved in harvesting and processing throughout the chain. We work through various partnerships. A lot of different organizations have actually collaborated in helping to develop the standard itself and test it in practice. And we maintain quite a few um, important operational partnerships so we work with the IUCN Medicinal Plant Specialist Group to look at the species that are being proposed for certification. Um, we work with Traffic, who Nastya has, has just represented. Um, Traffic were both involved in creating the standard and also in supporting its uptake. We have some site-specific collaborations with WWF and ProFounder Consultancy Group who work on value chain development and they're also engage with us a lot in, in the fair wild development. Okay, next slide. Thanks. So our work involves managing the standard. So both responding to feedback and training people and about it day to day, but also managing standard setting processes and revisions of the standard. Um, we manage the certification scheme itself. So we have an accreditation program for uh, certification bodies and we oversee how the certification scheme runs and we manage the use of the Fair Wild label on finished products that include Fair Wild certified ingredients. So what we really aim to do is to convene a network of companies that want to work together in um, working towards wild plant sustainability and also value addition and investing into their supply chains and improving livelihoods for the people who harvest them. So we work as well to connect current and potential fair wild participating businesses. We also work with various other standard setting initiatives and different organizations that are involved in um, relevant um, activities around our standards. So also collaborating with organic and, and fair trade schemes, for example. So the certification itself, 
the certification is actually focused on the wild collection operations. So companies or cooperative groups that are actually managing the wild harvest in practice. So we have a detailed set of performance indicators that have all of the requirements that they need to meet in practice. Um, it is a third party audited scheme which requires an annual on-site audit. It's obviously something that's a little bit difficult at the moment with the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're also looking at alternatives, at least in the short term, to on-site audits. Um, so there's quite a lot of innovation, I think, happening in the auditing world at the moment. But we work with various control bodies that are accredited for the Fair Wild Scheme. The four that we're currently working with are listed at the bottom of the slide. So Fair Wild has a continuous improvement approach. Not everything has to be implemented from year one, but um, every year the, the participating companies can improve their practice and increase their total score, as well as increasing the minimum criteria that they have to meet. We also make a distinction between different types of plant species that are being certified under the program. So we make a distinction at the application stage, working together with the IUCN Medicinal Plant Specialist Group. And we class the species as low, medium or high risk. So a low risk species would be one that is widespread and perhaps is harvested in a non-destructive way, leaves rather than roots, for example. And a high risk species would be one where there are perhaps some known conservation concerns, a species that regenerates quite slowly and perhaps a destructive harvesting practice. So low risk species would need a lower level of management effort and monitoring that go into their management as compared to high risk species. So the standard itself has 11 principles. 10 of them apply to the wild collection operations and they cover different areas including conservation issues, so how the, wild, the target plant itself is managed and whether it is harvested in a sustainable way, but also the impacts of that harvesting on the wider landscape and the species and habitats that are associated with the plant. The social and fair trade requirements are broadly similar to other social and fair trade standards that, that you'll find available, uh, but it's quite specialised for wild collection situations. So usually the people who are doing harvesting are not employees of the um, wild collection operation. So we look very carefully at the contractual relationships between the harvesters and the company that is purchasing from them. We also are quite specialised in how we approach the participation of children in wild collection activities because there can be traditional and cultural participation of children in harvesting, but of course they shouldn't be part of the workforce. So we look at that quite carefully and control that they're not being exploited in any way in the harvesting. Um, we have a premium fund approach. So uh, an additional premium payment that it can be used to invest in, in social projects with the collectors in their communities and we also have fair pricing aspects for the harvesters and social responsibility including fair working conditions for all of the workers at the wild collection operation. On the legal and ethical side um, we look quite carefully at land tenure and any rules around protected areas and from. I think Emily will talk a little bit more about that. And we look at management practices overall. So does the collection operation manage the harvesting in a responsible way? And do they also have responsible business practices, including how they calculate their costs and incorporate them into their prices? And we also have a very important principle for the buyers from, of the wild collected products. So companies that are purchasing the ingredients, we really ask them to commit to paying fair prices and to investing into the Fair Wild Premium Fund and really working with their supply chain to support them on their wild sustainability journey. Okay, next slide. So this, I think, is my final slide. Uh, it just shows a simplified chain of custody for Fair Wild ingredients under the certification scheme. 
as I mentioned, the certification itself is for the certified collection operation, so the company that is harvesting the ingredients. We also have other companies in the chain of custody that need to register directly with Fair Wild Foundation and they will um, commit to trading according to the Fair Wild Trading Rules and maintain full traceability throughout the, their chain of custody. And they'll also send us an annual declaration every year of ingredients that they've purchased and sold. So brand manufacturers can register with us as licensees. So they'll also sign a license contract and that allows use of the Fairwild label on product labeling and also marketing and communicating about products that include Fairwild certified ingredients. And there are, there are fees applicable for license um, use of products and also for, for registered traders. So the labelling rules themselves, you can actually use the Fairwild label on products that contain any Fairwild ingredients. You can, can do that in um, a less prominent way by including the label on the ingredients list, but you would need to indicate exactly which ingredients are Fairwild certified and the percentage of them. If you want to use the Fairwild um, label more prominently, so on the front of pack or as part of the Fairwild name, then we look also at the other ingredients that are in the product. Are they organic or fair trade? And we recognize other fair trade labels that will um, contribute to that. Um, yeah, so I think that's just wrapping up the final part of this slide. Yeah, we do work also with other fair trade programs. So Fair Wild is also recognized under the Fair for Life scheme, for example, and uh, I think partly compatible also with Fair Trade USA. So yeah, we work to make our program interoperable with other standards as well. Okay, and I'll pass back to Emily. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Bryony, for that introduction to Fair Wild. Uh, so now we have a sense of the issues surrounding wild plant trade, but also how Fair Wild can help to address those. I'd like to, to focus a bit now on what Fairwild can mean for you as a business. Um, so for Fairwild usage, we see that there are a lot of benefits, social, environmental, but I wanted to cover and really focus now on the ones that really speak to the business impacts of Fairwild. Uh, so that can be demonstrating legality, reporting against social and environmental frameworks, uh, and other corporate and social responsibility indicators, um, thinking about ensuring you have longevity of your supply chains, and also how Fair Wild certification relates to your consumers. So first off, legal harvesting and trade. Uh, now clearly that's a cornerstone of a business's sourcing and supply chain, uh, but as Nastia explained, it can be tricky with wild plant ingredients, um, where their regulations are complex and there are traditional use cases and also international agreements to consider. Uh, but with Fair Wild, as, as Bryony uh, touched on, Fairwild certification requires demonstrated compliance with local and national laws. So the information on in the documentation package uh, that Fairwild collection operations have to compile can help companies further up the supply chain demonstrate legal compliance if required. Uh, so for example, compliance with the Lacey Act in the United States. Um, Fairwild certification of ingredients that you use means that you know the traceability information will be available and the framework of Fair Wild standard helps with the compilation of that information. It can also help with international trade agreements um, such as CITES or the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Fauna and Flora, where sustainable, har sustainable harvesting is important. Uh, the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing is also supported through principle four of the Fair Wild standard, which really looks at um, agreements on access rights and fair and equitable sharing of benefits. That, so that's sort of the, the legal um, compliance side of things, but then looking at how Fairwild can support and strengthen your reporting of um, your corporate and social responsibility. Uh, so one way that businesses do this in increasingly is through the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, there are 17 global goals, and these are the basis of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So they're a globally accepted framework and they, they really are a way for businesses to show how they make an impact at the global level. 
And Fair World certification clearly contributes to six of these 17 goals. And so by using Fair World ingredients, your business can too. Uh, so for example, by providing practical measures to reduce poverty through the premium price paid to collectors, the premium fund, um, building capacity on value addition in plant uh, trade chains, um, and helping to ensure long-term market access can help to reduce poverty um, and reduce inequalities. Preventing discrimination and limiting participation of children in wild collection helps to ensure decent work and economic growth. Supporting fair and equitable conditions for employment, um, including ethnic minorities and women, helps to support gender equality and also um, reducing inequalities as well. Reinforcing um, respect of customary rights, uh, ensuring that decisions are made transparently and democratically, empowering harvesters and workers to participate in decision making and resource management. These all are aspects of the Fair Wild Standard that are assessed during certification and help to contribute to the sustainable development goals. Um, and then also, obviously, importantly, uh, the, the Fair Wild Standard looks at sustainable use and ensures that there are um, resource assessments, risk assessments and area management plans. So not just management of the species being harvested, but also um, sustainable management of the area that pl plant and fungi and lichen are being harvested from. SDGs though, are just one um, of the higher level frameworks that companies look at in terms of their environmental reporting. But there are some others that are used which are targeted maybe more to consumers rather than stakeholders or shareholders, uh, such as B Corp certification. Uh, so this is a certification for whole businesses that demonstrates social and environmental performance. Um, and it really requires that you, you look at all aspects of your organization and Fair World Certification can help to um, improve your score on, on the questionnaire for B Corp Certification on some of the aspects. So for example, uh, you're required to demonstrate social or environmental screening of suppliers. So if you're showing that you purchase from Fair World Certified Operations, then this will help with that. Um, you're also asked to look at, uh, do you use third party certifications related to social and environmental performance? And the Fair World Standard obviously uh, meets both of those criteria. In terms of other labels as well, as Bryony mentioned, Fair Wild is, is sort of recognised by Fair for Life as well. So there's also the option for companies that want to put more than one label on their packaging, um, not just B Corp or Fair Wild, but also Fair for Life. And we're always sort of working at what other ways we can, we can collaborate with other um, standard setting organisations. Then thinking about the, the supply chain again, um, as Bryony mentioned, there are aspects of the Fair Wild Standard that really look at the buyer commitment. Um, so the Fair Wild Standard and certification encourages a deep relationship with suppliers um, and collection operations. So even if you're as, as the brand aren't directly buying from the collection operations, your trader will be cultivating these relationships. And by having those deep relationships, you can help to influence the quality of the product to, to meet your requirements. You also know that by there being long term management plans and sustainable harvesting, you're really planning for having that product in your supply chain for the long term. Uh, all that might be very well, but you might think ultimately you actually need your product to sell and is certification really worth it? Um, happily for Fairwild and other certification standards, the research does firmly point to yes, this is what consumers are looking for. Um, so, for example, a 2017 survey by Unilever, a third of consumers said they buy from brands they believe are doing some form of good. And a fifth of uh, consumer surveys said they would actively choose brands if the sustainability credentials were clearer on the packaging. So by putting a label such as the Fairwild label on your product, so showing you use Fairwild ingredients, you're really speaking to that fifth of consumers that are looking for that uh, demonstration of your sustainability credentials. Uh, then uh, just last year, a survey by Globescan showed that two thirds of respondents said their loyalty to brands. So the fact that they, they repeat purchases is motivated by a desire to see some form of positive impact on the world. So again, that can be using the Fair Wild label showing that you are thinking about the future and sustainability of your wild plant harvesting. And then you might think that maybe people's purchasing patterns would have been influenced by the, the latest epidemic and it, they have. Um, but a 
nearly half the consumers are now saying that they're making more sustainable choices rather than less and that those are likely to continue post sort of the COVID-19 in the, the COVID-19 world. So really the, the point I'm trying to make here is that fair wild labeling gives you a way to clearly demonstrate your sustainability commitments to your consumers. And it doesn't just have to be labels you put on the packaging. Uh, there's obviously lots of other communication avenues that, that brands will use to, to reach their market. And with Fair Wild, you can really uh, share some, some really unique stories. Um, so both about the, the human stories in terms of the people that are collecting um, those wild plant ingredients, but also about the places that they originate from, those wild places. Um, and wild is really the, the sort of central tenet of Fair Wild um, and something unique to us. Um, so there are some examples here, some screenshots of um, interviews with Baobab collection operations, um, a collection operation in Poland uh, about an ancient woodland um, and helps to protect that area, um, traditional harvesting of rose hips in Serbia and so on. Uh, but, but finally, the, it's not just plants and, and wild habitats, obviously. Some people are just more, more interested or, or react more to, to animals being presented to them as well. Um, and with Fair Wild certification, you've also not got just the plants that are being harvested, but also the animals that use the same habitats and therefore have um, sort of knock-on benefits as well. So we've got uh, elephants in areas where baobab is harvested, for example, or greater um, hornbill, which nests almost exclusively in trees where Fair Wild bibitaki fruit is harvested. Um, we've also got um, species which cohabit with plant ingredients that could be certified fair wild. So um, Jatamansi in Nepal, for example, or um, giant panda, which uh, shares habitat with Sushandra. And we're uh, collaborating now with the Wildlife Friendly Enterprise Network um, and starting to look into options or ways we could explore joint certification with them. So again, if that's something you're interested in or, or would like to explore more, then do get in touch with us. But you also don't have to take our word for it. So uh, this is a quote I found just today, actually, which I, I really like. Um, so this is from American Botanical Council, Mark Blumenthal. Fair wild certification is not a fad, it is a trend. So this is a growing movement and it's something you wanna get on, on board with now. Um, there's also brands that are currently involved with us. Now, uh, I won't read them out to you because we're, we're short on time, but just to know that the brands that are currently involved are really seeing the benefits of um, using fair wild ingredient. Um, other ado, I will pass over to Sebastian because I think I've taken longer than I should have done talking to you about what the benefits are. Um, so Sebastian Paul is the co-founder of Pucker Herbs, a UK-based herbal products company and also a traditional me herbal medicine practitioner. Um, he's passionate about the sustainable supply of organic herbs as well as working with communities to protect both their livelihoods and local ecosystems. And Pucker has been a fair wild brand since 2012. And Sebastian is now going to tell us a bit more about what that means to them. Sebastian. Thanks, Emily. Hi, everyone. Really good to be here. Interesting hearing the stories so far. As Emily said, uh, Pucker has been part of fair wild since 2012. And I'm a massive fan of fair wild. Not because it's easy, because let's not pretend it is. Um, and nor is it necessarily convenient in a world of complexity, but it is one of the best standards for delivering on our duty, our moral duty as business people to make a profit without damaging society or the planet. So for that reason, I'm a fan. And because, you know, we depend on plants for all of our life, don't we really? And there's all this talk, essential talk around climate change, and Fair Wild is one of the few uh, certifications that allows you to promote your work to engage with ecosystem holism, if you like, and the sort of total biodiversity conversation which we need to address. And so when I started Pucker with Tim back in 2001, we had this idea of, uh, next one please, Emily, of uh, driving conservation through commerce. A little sort of simple idea, but how could we um, help the wild to flourish uh, whilst we were extracting and taking ingredients from it. Obviously we know that a high percentage of herbal ingredients are coming from the wild uh, in terms of our medicinal needs and our therapeutic needs we're going to be dependent on it for a long time so how could we protect that um, and so 
along with all the other logos one can get these days to communicate your responsibility to your customers, Fairwild is the only one that really represents ecological biodiversity um, in an absolute sense, as well as protecting the people at the edges of society that are marginalized. And so it, it takes some work to implement it, but once it is in your system, it just becomes like any of these things like B Corp or organic, it becomes a habit. And I've found it inspiring to many people in Pucker um, and outside. You know, it inspires your team to feel that they're working with purpose and direction. And that is an enormous benefit that isn't uh, totally related to working with the uh, collectors on the ground or your, or your customer facing efforts. So I've got a, uh, a few stories that I'd like to tell to try and bring alive what uh, uh, Nastia, Brian, and Emily have been saying before. And so, is that the next slide, Emily? I don't think that's the next slide. <laughs> I think it's licorice is the next one. Uh, basically, I wanted to tell uh, three stories how um, Fair Wild can protect the resource, can protect the plants, um, it can protect the people and uh, it, it can protect the whole ecosystem. So with regards to licorice, for example, it's on a five year, potentially six year rotation in the wild. You know, you can't harvest it uh, year after year. So one of the benefits with uh, Fair Wild is that you do a resource assessment. So you measure a fixed area, say a thousand hectares of wild land. Um, you can divide it into plots. Uh, the resource assessment allows you to understand how frequently you can go back to those plots. So as a brand uh, with a mission, you know that you will never overuse that supply from that, that source. And that is essential for um, knowing that you're not depleting uh, nature. Emily, are you uh, driving or we got a little um, technical moment? I can keep talking then. Okay, we'll go to Elderflower. Perfect. And um, this is quite a beautiful story, really, um, that in uh, across Europe now, you know, we know elderflowers are flowering, uh, potentially being harvested. But 20 years or so ago in Bosnia with the, the terrible war there, lots of communities got divided. And what we found is that through engaging with the Fair Wild a Standard, uh, the local communities there are uh, coming back together basically, and the, the Christian and the Muslim communities are now going out and harvesting elderflower together. Uh, is it not going forward, the slides? They're not. Okay, I'll just keep talking then. <laughs> um, and I just threw in this elderberry elderflower slide because of COVID at the moment, and uh, Nastia referring earlier to uh, the need we have uh, to benefit from some of the protective compounds that are available in nature and elderberry happens to have been shown to be protective against 12 different types of flu viruses i'm not saying covid but it's got this incredible ability to uh, deactivate uh, viral replication so it can prevent the virus from replicating in your respiratory system um, you know it's difficult to put a value on that isn't it when we've got something like elderberries elderflowers on our doorstep um, maybe keep rolling through this and then this is just a picture of the project in Bosnia and you can see elderflower here is a um, spontaneous species that arises out of a wasteland and keep going and you, you can see that the that as the community goes out back into this regenerating wild land uh, it is also bringing them together through a shared responsibility for the wild lands for their uh, income and to create a better future for people. And in lots of the projects we work with around the world, you continually see people coming together um, because of the need to relate to the forest department, to the local traders who might be invading their area a little bit, to you know cross-cultural sections of society. So I thought this quote was nice. Um, you know, in the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand. We'll understand only what we're taught. Um, and I don't mean to be condescending by saying it, but it is a fact that wild herbs are under threat. And if you're using anything from the wild in terms of a business 
continuity and risk situation, uh, that supply might not be there in the future. So we, we need to protect it now uh, for, for the multiple reasons that I've, I've been saying, but particularly if one's interested in your bottom line, basically. Um, so you know, how can we make it part of our business to be part of the solution? How does you know, what we're selling, the products we're creating to sell to uh, customers and consumers, how do they bring benefit to the world at the same time? And, and Fair Wild just ties into this whole movement around assessing our uh, targets for preventing climate change or climate impact and um, our commitments to promoting biodiversity. So just as an example about how Fair Wild fitted into Pucker's work, um, you, know, and, uh, you know, we've looked at what our problem is. We got a security with our uh, security issue with our supply. Um, we analyzed our crop to cut of our carbon and knowing where our suppliers are based from a wild point of view and the volumes that are coming from there, we can assess that carbon impact. And then we can communicate this and we can share that with our, with our customers and we can, we can sleep well at night knowing that the herbs we're buying and sharing uh, as the volume increases will be uh, secure and sustainable forevermore. So I think I'll, I'll stop there and try and keep us on time. But I just can't encourage you enough. If you're thinking about it, if you're in the finance department, if you're in the buying department, if you're a CEO listening now, you know, get your team together and um, see how inspiring going for Fair World can be for you and your business and your customers. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Katie Huggins. Uh, Katie is Vice President of Technical Services at Traditional Medicinals, which is a USA-based wellness brand. She brings decades of experience to her role, including quality control, legal and regulatory teams and sustainability efforts at Traditional Medicinals. Traditional Medicinals has been a farewell brand since 2012, and Katie is now going to tell us a bit more about what that means to them. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Emily, for the nice introduction, and I've, I've really appreciated the other presentations. It's been great. Um, Traditional Medicinals is probably familiar to a lot of people, certainly within our industry. We are a botanical wellness company with a focus on tea. Uh, we started out in tea mainly, and most of our business is still in medicinal tea. Um, we've branched out recently to include tinctures uh, from the Urban Moonshine brand, um, capsules and lozenges. So the scope of the company is herbal medicinal products now, but again with a focus on tea. Was, we were founded in 1974, uh, as I say, to change lives with the power of plants. Drake Sadler is a, was a community organizer, among other things. Uh, Rosemary Gladstar, a community herbalist. So there was a focus always from the beginning on community, on people and plants. There was a commitment also to organic from the inception of the company to environmental sustainability. And early on, Drake traveled and Rosemary traveled to Guatemala to look at um, lemongrass that we were buying there. And with that and, and the background in community organization, Drake really took on and understood that there was an issue with the social equity of the people who grew, harvested, and or collected these plants. And that that was part of the chain of responsibility that we all have from the very start through the end of the finished products that we sell to consumers. Traditional medicinals and fair wild, we do have a long history. 50% um, or actually greater than 50% of the botanicals we use are wild collected. So it's, it's a key resource for us for the company and for what we're trying to do in the world. Uh, I think Nastasia uh, mentioned 3,000 plants or, or medicinal plants are wild collected. And there's 28,000 that have some indication of medicinal or aromatic use. That makes it very important to companies that depend on those wild plants for their business and to do, do what they do in the world. TM's dedicated to being a brand that's good for people and the planet. And that also includes animals. I thought that was a very interesting bit. Um, 
there are, by preserving it habitat, you make it possible for the animals to remain and you preserve them. We conducted a, a joint test implementation in 2007 of the Fair Wild Standard before it merged with the ISSC map uh, at two different sites, one in Kazakhstan and one in the Russian Federation. And that was sort of, that wasn't actually the beginning. I think Joseph Brinkman, who many people may know, participated in several of the conferences that started to organize these standards. Um, but in 2007, the company made a commitment to do these test implementations, and we were very pleased with the results. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, we have an ongoing partnership with Fair Wild, multiple collection communities, and multiple plant species. So I do have a background in quality, and, and of course, the first thing that I noticed from that just that test implementation report was that I was having access to all kinds of information that are very hard, that's very hard to come by unless you're actually on site. And it was collected uh, against a rigorous standard, so it was, it was very complete. And there were there are probably three really important things. Most of our, our products are dietary supplements in the US, so they have a purely set of regulations around them. One of the most important is confirmation of identity. And with Fair Wild, you have this assurance that starts right at the beginning with the resource assessment that tells you what plants are there and what species are there and also what's uh, not just the plants that you're interested in but what else is there and that those are all relevant for sort of assessing the risk of both adulteration as well as the sustainability risks of the plant. Clearly the fact that so many species are threatened is really uh, critical to the quality assurance of it. Uh, species pressure also leads to collection of other species uh, that you don't intend to collect. So from a quality assurance point of view, it's extremely important to use these uh, certified supply chains. There's documented implementation of good agricultural and collection practices. If um, anyone needs to see that you've assured that. There's documented procedures and processes that support the requirements of current good manufacturing practices. So whether you're doing a food or a supplement, you have a requirement to assess the risk in your supply chain uh, for various ingredients. Um, and you do it maybe a little bit differently depending on the regulatory scheme, but Fairwild certification and, and the audit reports that go with it are a really incredible tool for doing that risk assessment or or helping you to complete that risk assessment in a good way. We are um, fair uh, wild license holders and we have the logo on our boxes. Um, we think that it's important to communicate to consumers all of the standards with which we comply, in part to build a qual the quality story. You know, this is a quality of, of, of your brand that you're representing and to communicate what's valuable to us as a brand and what we represent in the world. There's obvious benefits to supply chain. And what I want to say is that Fairwild has multiple benefits within the organization. Emily touched on many of them. I um, want to maybe speak sort of specifically to some traditional medicinal supply chain and the way it's, it's worked for us. One of the great benefits is this established partnership from producer to first buyer and beyond. Through Fair Wild certification, we've worked very closely with both producer groups and our and the first buyers and, and second buyers in some cases, and uh, developed these great networks of relationship that help to assure supply. A lot of uh, of supply is built around relationships, and having this sort of equitable trading behind all of this is really important to those relationships and to the people in the chain. Um, it gives you unprecedented access to information, which I, I already referred to, um, but also from a supply chain point of view, uh, not just a quality assurance point, point of view. It can result in early knowledge of supply issues and an opportunity for collaborative problem solving. We've done problem solving. We have excellent partners uh, all along the way. And when particular problems come up, whether it be um, uh, a mycotoxin in a root or something like that. The partners organized around it and the access to information 
sort of the well-built um, collection networks and training from the Fairwild groups really helps you solve those problems in a practical way and more quickly than you would be able to do otherwise. Um, development of a supply network with the ability to leverage known capable producers to spread risk. That's actually something that uh, has been extremely important for us. We have a philosophy of having at least two qualified producer groups for every ingredient that we buy and more for some of the more major ingredients um, where possible. And the Fairwild Network is a great source. Uh, quite often you'll see in the list of plants from a fair wild uh, producer that they also have these other three plants that you also are interested in. And so it's a great way to branch your network out to give you a uh, sustainable supply, but to also keep it within this certification that has these other benefits um, that I've talked about. Sustainability reporting is more and more important. There's certainly B Corp. Um, we actually produce an annual sustainability report um, and it's an important piece of information that we put out to our stakeholders, uh, our invest, anyone, uh, potential investors, um, potential business partners, and then to the public, to consumers. It talks about the things that we do uh, to build a sustainable, not only a sustainable supply, but to make a sustainable product. Uh, B Corp certification is, a, is an important um, certification for us. We uh, were recognized as, uh, let's see, what is it? Best for the world 2019, among many other honorees, and it, it wasn't exclusive to TM, but it was a nice acknowledgement. According to B Corp, 66% of consumers will pay more for sustainable brands. That's a little more than I think Unilever found. Um, I think it, it, what it does indicate is how important sustainable, sustainable, sustainability and sustainable brands are becoming. 86% uh, of employees believe it's important to work with a responsible company. Um, I think that one's become very important for us in recruiting as we look to new hires and as we look to retain the people, the people that, uh, that work for us. And as we build a culture within the company, this sort of commonality around fair wild uh, types of products, fair trade, all of the sustainability efforts is really important to people. And particularly now with, um, the, with younger generations, these are things that bring people to your company and help you to attract really good workers who care about what they're doing and care about the same things that we do as a company. Um, there's no doubt that Fair Wild certification has a positive impact on our sustainability scores, in particular, um, our uh, poverty alleviation. It contributed quite a bit to our poverty alleviation score, which is natural. And then we agree that the, um, the land and wildlife conservation efforts are supported by Fair Wild. And that's a very interesting thing that is beginning to become important. Uh, wildlife certification standards and logos that go with the products. There's, I guess, uh, let me digress just a moment and talk about the um, uh, marketing aspect, the communications aspect. So traditional medicinals uh, uses social media quite a bit to educate consumers, which is part of our long-term mission and to, in particular, educate them about plants. So uh, as part of that, we had the New York Times uh, visit a, collecting, uh, a collection site in Poland, Runo, uh, one of our long-term partners, and they did a story from there. It was a paid piece, but the story was really impressive and, and showcased um, the fair wild efforts. And the thing about it was for our marketing department, uh, the fact that it was in the fair wild net network gave us relationship to the people that provided the information, the story, uh, the people from Runo and the collectors themselves. Um, it gave us sort of unprecedented access and quick access to be able to do the story with the New York Times. Um, it gave us a really compelling marketing piece and a story to to use on our website and to send out to other people. 
Um, and it is, uh, was an excellent educational piece as well that spoke not only about Fair Wild, but about the lives of people who collect wild plants. And that's something that people aren't that familiar with. And it's a really, uh, was a really easy way to connect people to plants as, as we talk about our, our first mission. Thinking ahead, uh, we're looking more and more to fair wild and standards like that for innovation. We look to, to our network of suppliers to provide these innovative ingredients. So I like the idea of the uh, wild dozen. Uh, how can you use these fair wild uh, resources to help create new, new products, new interesting and innovative products that have these fantastic stories behind them. Um, adding additional fair wild certified ingredients is pretty easy. If you have a network of producers, they all have lots of ingredients that they carry. So you can um, easily expand into that established supply and it's pretty easy for them to add new ingredients to the uh, standard if that's uh, needed. Um, established suppliers know how you work. They know what you're looking for. Uh, they have this groundwork of great documentation and uh, sustainable and, and fair and equitable uh, work in it, and it's all built in. So it's hard to, to understate how valuable that is as you go through new products. When you launch anything, you want more than anything else a sustainable supply of the ingredients that you put in there. Transparency and traceability are only going to become more important as time goes on. Um, I think that it's uh, truly a trend. People want to know where their food comes from, where their medicine comes from. They want to know the stories behind it. They want to know that they're not ruining habitats, exploiting people, exploiting animals, exploiting plants. Those things are important. They're important to us, and I'm sure they're important to all of you as well. And so it's a trend that we like. Thanks very much for listening. Well, thank you so much, Katie, for that. That was a, a really great to just hear directly from a brand exactly what it means to you to be to be using fair wild ingredients. So, so thank you for that. Um, you've already touched on some of the things I, I was going to mention next, but that, that's not a problem. I'm also conscious we're short for time, so I'm going to um, go a bit more quickly than I would have done. Um, we'll have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, and then we're always available via email. You can get in touch with us via our website as well. So if we don't have time to come to your question, do just get in touch with us afterwards. Um, so now I want to talk about how you can actually get involved with Fairwild. So as Katie mentioned, um, using Fairwild ingredients is a great way to, to get involved with, with Fairwild. Um, we've currently got 25 different um, ingredients that are certified. And you can see all of those in the full list all the time on our website. Uh, at the moment, those include things like frankincense and myrrh, um, rose hips, baobab, um, juniper, elderflower, hawthorn, and so on. But there's also a lot of ingredients which could be Fairwild certified, which those um, certified operators uh, could just add to their certification relatively easily. Or producers that may want to become certified, they just need to see some demand from brands. Um, and those are on our website as well. So do visit there and have a look at that list. That includes things like Desert Date, um, Marula, Sage, Cowslip, but there, there is a much longer list that's online. And again, that's updated all the time. So do just get in touch with us or with the companies that are listed on the website and let us know if you would be interested in using either their currently certified ingredients or ones which they would like to add to their certification. Um, you can also look at certifying your supply chain. Um, so it might be that you've already got a really strong relationship with suppliers that you use and you just want to, to add that certification um, to them. Um, so that's something you can certainly do. Just uh, review maybe which ingredients you have that are wild sourced if you don't already know. Maybe start with picking a key ingredient or a key supplier and it's, it's really pivotal for your brand. And then get in touch with us to discuss how you could move that forward. Um, we also like it if you, you tell people about Fair Wild. So we have an annual event every year online um, called Fair Wild Week. So this is an online ca campaign where we promote Fair Wild and responsible use of wild ingredients to consumers and also companies. Um, so all current Fair Wild brands get involved with this, but also um, Fair Wild, uh, companies that are interested in Fair Wild or just like what we're doing. Um, so do get in touch. 
follow that online and, and get in touch if you'd like some more information about how you can you can share the word on that one. Um, if you would maybe while you're sort of in the process of adding new ingredients or, or certifying your supply chain or you're just sort of not ready to do those at the moment but you still want to support us um, then it'd be really great if you could maybe become a friend of Fairwild um, and that's a way you can support the work of the Fairwild Foundation and our mission to have fair and sustainable wild collection and trade. Uh, so you can either become a friend of Fairwild online through our website or if you um, are participating in 1% for the planet, you can also donate to us via that, um, that uh, scheme. And finally, we'd love it if you told a business friend about us. So tell a colleague or someone in your network about Fairwild and just start a conversation about what um, wild plant ingredients mean to you. It sort of remains for me to highlight what the next steps are. So as I say, think about what ingredients you use that are wild sourced, Maybe think about reviewing your supply chain and how you can integrate fair wild ingredients into that. Um, share the webinar recording when we send it out um, and get in touch with us to either um, hopefully register as a, as a fair wild brand or to talk about certifying your supply chain. Um, and we do have a lot of information on our website. So hopefully that's there, we'll help answer any questions, but it, it can be a bit daunting when you first start. So do just get in touch um, at any point in, in, your, in the process. Um, and finally, I'd just like to thank all of our friends of Fairwild who, who supported our work in 2019. Um, and it could be you supporting us in 2020. Um, and just say thank you to everyone for, for joining us. And uh, I hope you have a, a good day if it's your morning or a, a good evening if it's, if it's the end of the day for you. Um, and be in touch. Okay, thank you.